Hello to all my Facebook friends. I have a message for Mother's Day that I want to share with you. And I pray that it won't only speak to mothers, but it'll speak to fathers and to you men out there. It is something that's been on my heart and I'm really thrilled to share it this weekend. Father, I pray that you will speak to our hearts. Jesus, we want to be like you. We want you to have your way in our lives. And I pray, God, that you will draw us close to you through everything that's going on and that you would have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. I have entitled this, No Names and Castaways, because so many of us are not known by everybody all over the place and some of us feel like we've been castaways as well and so as I get into this and we every single one of us come from a different background and every single one of us have been through difficulties in our lives and the Lord cares about every single thing we've ever ever been through and so I took some time this week to look up some different women in the Bible that they don't have a name in the Bible, but we can learn from these women. And some of them are married and some are not. And because there's so many different types of people in the world, we have got to be able to look at the whole gamut everything that's involved and so I went through and did a little study for today and it's like I said it's very dear to me and my prayer is that it will minister to you and let's pray right now father I want to thank you for your presence I want to thank you that you are with us that you walk with us and that you care about every single thing that is going on in our lives Father, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for Holy Spirit. I thank you for the Word of God and the things that we can learn in the Word of God to better our lives and to help us be the best that we can be in this life. And Father, I commit this time into your hands. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I was going through and I was studying this and looking at a few different women that don't have any name because so often we preach on the person who has a name but I wanted to pull out some things that could benefit us today from people who don't have a name and one of the women and we've heard this preached on a lot is Lot's wife here they are living in an area in the world and it is a horrific situation. They are involved in the world. They are living in the world. And they're about to be destroyed. This city is about to be destroyed because of the evilness that's there and everything that is surrounding them. And these two angels come into the city and they are welcomed by Lot. And Lot brings them home. And the evil, wicked people of the city wanted to have their way with these angels. And these angels are warning Lot that the city is about to be destroyed. And he tells them to get his family together, his wife together, his two daughters together. I'm not going to go into the whole story here because I could really drag this out but I want to cover four different people today. And as they are getting everything together to leave, and the, there's a little bit of a struggle going on, go and tell a few people, warn them, they can go with you, whoever will be willing to go with you, that they would leave the world. And the only ones that were walking outside the city was Lot, his wife, and his two daughters and the angel said to leave the city and not only that he gave they gave more instruction involved in this to not 
turn around and look back. Don't look at the world. Don't look at the city behind you. Don't be drawn to look back. And the first thing that we can learn from Lot's wife is that she was disobedient. When God gives us a word, and He does, He has the Word of God out there for us to be obedient to the Word of God. They had angels that were leading them out, but we today have the Word of God, and the Word of God is so explicit. It has all the instruction in there that we need to be obedient to. Righteousness, spending time in the Word of God, and praying, and putting into practice the Word of God. But they, she was given one assignment, to leave the city and not turn and look back. She was disobedient. The one thing that we can learn from Lot's wife a woman that does not have a name, but we can learn from her, is that God wants our obedience. He wants us to be obedient to Him. The more we disobey, the more our heart hardens toward the instruction that God has for us. The more that we are, we listen to the Word of God and we don't do it, it's obe disobedience. And our heart is hardened because of that disobedience. And it becomes easier and easier and easier to be disobedient to the instructions of God. And He is so clear and He is so explicit in wanting us to live a holy and righteous life, not be captivated by the world, not to be drawn back to look at the world. He doesn't want us to come to Him and then turn around and go back to it. He wants us to be obedient to Him. And if we fall in love with Jesus and we fall in love with the Father, then it is easier to be obedient to the Father and what God wants from us. So let's learn from Lot's wife and be obedient, not disobedient, but obedient to God's Word. And then also looking at the children. They had been raising their children in the world. And you look at the daughters. The, the mother is turned into a pillar of salt. And the more we disobey, our hearts are hardened. But these two daughters, when they went off with their father, they had the worldly mentality inside of them. So that when they're with their father in the cave and they plan, um, you know, they say, well, we don't have a husband. We don't have anybody to carry on the lineage. And so that worldly nature was in them from Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't want to raise our children in the world. The Bible says to be the in the world, but not of the world. And they obviously had taken on a lot of characteristics from the world in order for them to have the mentality that they are going to cause their father to become drunk and then have a child with him. That is the world's mentality. God does not want us to have the world's mentality. And so what we can learn from them as this couple is not to be raising our children in the world, but rather in God's world, His ways, His thoughts. And how do we do that? We have to stay in the Word of God, and we have to stay in prayer, and we have to be yielding to Him and obedient to Him for this to take place. That is the first person that I wanted to talk about was Lot's wife. And we are living in the world but we don't have to be of the world. We can live in the world and have godly mentality, godly ways, godly thoughts, and be obedient to what God has for us. So that's point number one. Number two is, let's get to it. I want to also share these scriptures with you. Psalm 119, 
57, it says, You are my portion, Lord. I have promised to obey your words. And then in Psalm 119, 67, it says, Before I was afflicted and I went astray, I went astray, but now I obey your word. That's what he wants us to do. We've all gone astray. I know the first 18 years of my life, I was estranged from God. But when I came back to Him, now I obey His Word. Now I obey it. Psalm 119, 101, it says, I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey Your Word. He wants us to be obedient to His Word, not living the way the, the enemy and the world sets before us. I remember one time my son, who was 13, and he said to me, so now that I'm 13, can I go to see movies that are for PG-13? And I said, son, that in all actuality is a standard that is set by the world. We need to look at every single one of those movies and see how many bad words are in it, all the different scenes that are inappropriate before you go and see something. Because there's a standard set by God, and we, that's the standard we need to live by, not the world's standard. And so I want to encourage you to be 100% in one accord with God's instruction and His plan for your lives. And in Ephesians 2, verse 2, it says, In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So we were once part of that. And then in Psalm 25, verse 4, it says, Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. So that we can live the way that God had initially intended for us to live. He never intended for us to be overtaken by the world and overcome by the world. But He intended for us to be overcomers of the world. The next person, number two, that I want to talk about is another couple that is very, um, you've heard a lot about Job. And, but I'm going to focus in on a little bit about Job's wife. I, I don't know about any of you guys, but I had an attitude towards Job's wife. But let me get into this just a little bit first. He was living for God praying regularly for his family and his children, and then suddenly everything changed. He lost his oxen, he lost the donkeys, sheep, servants, camels, sons and daughters. He lost everything. Everything was wonderful. He had everything, and then all of a sudden he has lost everything. And then it, the, what I love about this, this scripture here in Job chapter 1, the very last verse in that chapter, it says, Job 122, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. He didn't sin. He didn't look at it and blame God, but his heart remained tender towards God. And then in the next chapter, he, his body is covered by sores. He's being attacked on his body. And here he is scraping his skin. And his wife comes to him, and he, she says to him in Job chapter 2, 9 and 10, it says, His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Well, here I had an attitude towards Job's wife just from that one sentence. And how many of us have gone through something in life and have, from 
our pain and our suffering, we lash out at somebody. Well, what was she lashing out? I had never thought about it before, but Job, it said, lost 10 children. But his wife lost 10 children too. She had carried them in her womb. She had raised them from little children and she was very connected. Every mother is very connected to their children. And was she speaking from her pain? When I had lost my husband and I lost my son and I was reading this section of scripture in the Bible, that jumped out at me that she also had lost 10 children. Here is a mother that had lost 10 children and in the midst of her pain, she lashed out. Job didn't, but she did. But that caused me to have such an attitude towards her. And since I've read that scripture and I realize that somebody can, can be talking and somebody can be sharing and lashing out from their pain, from the things that they've been going through, and then we develop this attitude towards that person from that one sentence. When we're witnessing to somebody and they lash out and they say, get out of my face, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to respond, leave me alone, back off. And we listen to that one sentence and we don't want to witness to them anymore because of that one sentence that we have developed an attitude towards that person for that one line, that one thing that they said. And I realized after reading this about Job's wife, she's a no name. Nobody knows her name. She is called Job's wife. And then he says to his wife, which this is just, um, I love his response to this. These are couples, these are teams, these are, they have been together. And he says in verse 10, he replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. We can learn from this couple that no matter what we go through, that we have got to be leaning on God. We have got to be, um, he, he's got to be our all in all. Job, his example there, but the wife also, we can learn from her example that this is not what the answer the answer is not lashing out. The answer is not questioning God. The answer is not pulling away from God. But we are supposed to be drawing close to God. We are all going through a struggle right now. And there's a lot of people out of work. You might feel like you're in a Job situation where you've lost everything, where everything seems to be falling apart. Back in the day, the things that, that Job lost were a lot of his, his harvest, his, um, all the different animals, and his sons and daughters. Job went through so many things in life, and so did his wife. They had lost so many things, and you may feel like you have lost so much in life. Right now, during this whole situation of what we're going through in the world, people are without their jobs, people are having financial situations and problems that are going on. And we don't understand so many things that are uncertain at this time. And we, you might feel like you're going through a Job situation. But I want you to know that we have got to have the mentality and the thought of what, how Job took it, that it's not an attack on him. This is not the time to turn our back on God. This is the time to draw close to him. And it's not the time to lash out as, as well. We can't be like Job's wife and be lashing out and saying, let's curse God. Let's just give it all up. It's not, that is not the answer. We have got to stay close to the heart of God. We have got to stay close to Him. We've got to stay in the Word of God. We've got to stay in prayer. Now more than ever, we should be leaning on Him, trusting in Him through the situations that we're going through. When uh, everything seems to be so uncertain right now, 
God wants to be there with us in the situation, going through it with us, and letting His character be worked on in our lives. And how many of us, when somebody has lashed out with one sentence, and we're talking to them about Jesus, we're talking to them about the Lord, and they say, leave me alone, back off, I don't want to hear it, and we can't judge them by the one sentence of rejection. We have got to continue to reach out to these people, reach out to others, reach out to your family, be there for them. And I love what Job said here. He said, you, talk, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In this, Job did not sin in what he said. So we can't be foolish, we can't be lashing out, we can't be rejecting God. Now is the time to be drawing close to Him. Now is the time for Him to be our best friend, he, for Him to be walking through this life with us. And so I love this story, that because all of us are going through something. And so I love this story. My third person that I want to share with you about is Noah and his wife. I can tell you in my over 40 years of ministry, it's very rare that I have ever heard anybody speak about Noah's wife. We all hear about Noah, how he built a boat, how he put all of his attention into this and for this close to a hundred years it took to build this ark. But here is the thing, Noah's wife stuck with him. He, God spoke to him and she believed in her husband. She was persistent. It doesn't say in there that she ran off and she went crazy and that she wanted him to give this up, give up this project, that she wanted him to turn away from this. No, this was a perfect example even though it doesn't go into any detail in here, you let your imagination go wild in thinking about Noah and his wife and his three sons and the three daughter-in-laws for a hundred year period. You know, they didn't have a, an electric saw to build the, the boat with, they, to cut down the trees, to make each piece of lumber the right size, to be able to put this boat together. But he had received a revelation from God, and he had instruction from God. And his wife stayed with him and worked by his side. And can you imagine, they had to plant their gardens, to grow their food. They had to tend to the animals. They had to be out there cutting down the trees and they had to be making this sap to put the, the lumber together and everything. But then once they get this boat done and the sons stood alongside their dad, was it because they watched the mother and the father so united together that the sons stood there going, I'm going to stand with my mom and my dad through all of this? And then the daughters-in-law, they stood with their husbands and they were all part of this um, getting on the boat. But you think of all the food that they had to get ready for all of them to eat. They didn't know how long they were going to be on this boat. They had no idea what all was going to be involved in this. But then they had to have food also for the animals. And they had to take care of the animals. And you know, was it Noah? Was he the only one that was shoveling the manure from all these animals? They worked as a team. And this is a perfect example of receiving a word from God, standing together, unified, where you're letting God lead, guide, and direct you. And no matter how hard the task is, that they were persistent. God wants us to be persistent in the task. He wants us to give everything to it. He doesn't want us to go through just a period of time and go, okay, I'm just going to do it for this little bit, and then I'm going to give up. No, they had to stay with it until the job was done. The task was over, and they believed in it. They walked in it. They walked it out. 
there might have been, you know, some attitudes that came up every now and then. The Bible doesn't talk about it. But you think about our families, how sometimes we have to, you know, we converse and we talk and we discuss and and they had to know that their dad was being obedient to God. And Noah's wife was obedient to God. Another no name. She was obedient. And they all made it on the boat. It wasn't they went through the whole thing and they did all of this and Noah is the only one that got to go on the boat. No, it was his wife, three sons, three daughters-in-law. And then I think about them as they're going through this whole thing. And the daughters-in-law... Were they concerned about their families, their mom and dad, their siblings? Did they try to talk to them? Did they try to get it so that they would want to be on this here big ark that was being built? Were they concerned that their family was going to die that when this flood that they didn't fully understand was coming, but that they were ready for it? How much of all this preparation that took place and the persistence when we get to the end and we are standing before God we want to know that we have been obedient to God we've been persistent and we've been consistent in doing the task that we are called to do and the number one task to me is staying or two things is staying in the Word of God because we don't all get an angel speaking to us and giving us instruction. Wouldn't that be wonderful if it was that easy that we could have an angel stand in front of us and tell us exactly what to do? Well, I'm telling you that the number one thing is if we stay in the Word of God, God will speak to you. God will direct your steps and He will tell you to stay in His Word and to stay in prayer, to stay in fellowship with Him, to stay close to Him. And that's with Noah and his wife, Noah especially, he was close to the heart of God, so much so that he heard from God, direction from God. And so we've got to do that. We have got to stay close. The fourth person that I want to talk, to, talk about today, you know, because we're talking about all these couples, Lot and his wife, Job and his wife, Noah and his wife. And you might be a single mom out there and you're thinking, well, this is a great message for all these couples out here. But what about me? I'm a single mom. I don't have a husband. Well, then I, I came across a story in the Word of God, and many of you will know it. Hagar. Sarah had gone to Abraham, and he, they didn't have any children. And she said, and this is in Genesis 16, and she says, Here, take my servant, and let's have a child through her. And so he does. You know, we might be doing things according to the word of to the world out there, the mentality of the world, and maybe we had a child according to you know the world standard, maybe outside of wedlock, and you get pregnant and you carry the baby full term and you become a single mom. Maybe you got married and you went through a divorce and you're a single mom now. Hagar is a perfect example of this because that when Ishmael gets to be about 17 years old, Abraham is told by Sarah to make her leave, go away. She was a castaway. She was sent away from the family. And Ishmael was Abraham's son. This broke his heart. He did not want to send her, him away and lose his son. But as we read this here story, I'm just going to give some highlights to this. It was, it was in 16, verse 10. And, it, and she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son. And it broke him. 
And so, but he went ahead and did it. God gave him peace that everything was going to be okay with Ishmael. Everything was going to be all right. But here he gets them ready and he gives them some water. In verse 15 it says, when the water, they'd given them some water and bread. In verse 15, they're out wandering in the desert. And when the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. Verse 17, God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? What is the matter, Hagar? I want you to know that you might not get a voice, but I'm telling you today, God cares about you and your situation. Everything that you're going through as a single mom, He wants you to know that He is there for you. And here it says, Be not afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Wow! God spoke to her. The angel spoke to her. And the best way that God can speak to you is through the Word of God, by going to church and listening to messages and praying. God will speak to you. Let Him give you instruction. Let Him be there by your side. You are not going through this by yourself. Don't let the enemy convince you that you are in this all by yourself. Don't let him do that. Verse 19, it says, Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. So bring your children, if you're a single mom with one, two, three, however many children you have, be a mom that will take your children to church so that they can grow in the things of God, so that their hearts can become, remain softened, be softened by the Holy Spirit so that they're growing in the things of God. Teach them how to get into the Word of God and pray. My mom was a, a mom without a husband. I was born out of wedlock. And then she married and had two sons in that marriage and she was divorced. She was a single mom with three kids. And then she remarried again and she had two more children. But when she was a single mom, she was watching Billy Graham on TV. She knelt down in front of that TV and she gave her heart to Jesus. And she asked God to help her be the best mom that she could be. Praying and in the Word of God. And she began to grow in the things of God. It took time. But you need that. You need to be walking in the presence of God. Walking and reading the Word of God. Letting Him direct your steps. Letting Him be your best friend and walk through this life together with Him and asking Him to speak to your children as well, that they draw close to Jesus. And don't turn your back on Him. That is not the answer. The answer is never turning our back on God. But it's drawing close to Him and in His Word and letting Him have His way in your life. And as you do this, God will be in control. You have got to speak into your children that God is with you. God is there for you. That you're not going through this by yourself. And let's hold back our frustrations. Let's hold back our lashing out. And let's take all of that to God. Leaning on Him and trusting in Him. No matter what you're going through in this life. If you can relate to one of these different people, these four different people that I've mentioned in the Word of God, whether you feel like a no-name or a castaway, 
We can learn from these no names and this castaway on how to lean on God and how not to turn our back on Him and not to go back to the world and have our heart turn into stone. He does not want us when, we're, when we lose a loved one and we lose things in life and you're going through a difficult time like we're going through at this moment, that it is not the time to curse God and die. It is not the time to do that. And then as Noah, we need to be, Noah and his wife, united in one mind, one purpose, drawing close to God. And as Hagar, she cried out. And Ishmael cried out. And God was there. Let God be there for you in the midst of whatever difficulty you're going through, whether everything is just wonderful. When things are wonderful, sometimes we don't go after God, but we should be going after God when things are hard and when things are wonderful. And I pray that you will stay in the Word, stay in prayer, that you will remember that whatever you're going through, God is with you. He wants us to be overcomers in this world. He wants us to be obedient to His Word. He wants us to be persistent and unified. And He wants us to know that He hears us and He cares about everything that we cry out to Him about. He cares. And so whatever it is you're going through, and I want you to pray for your situation, what you're going through, as I pray this prayer at the end. If you need Jesus to come into your life and to forgive you of your sins and forgive you, I want you to pray that. If you need Him to touch you so that your heart is not hardened, if you need Him to soften your heart because of the situation that you're in, if you, he, you need Him to unify you, then that's what I want you to pray for. Be totally honest with God. Father, right now, I pray for each person that's been listening today, and I pray that you touch their hearts and their lives, that they'll draw so close to you in your word and in prayer, and that they'll unify their families together, and that they'll be persistent and consistent in everything that you've called them to do in falling in love with you and living for you. Father, touch their lives and draw them close to you. In Jesus' name, amen.